punk is just a rebellious rock for all kids uh, all over. Not a bunch of old men playing music for your mothers and fathers. And that's what you have now, it's what they call rock. For instance? Uh, Sticks. <laughs> yeah. This movement is basically working class. It's nothing to do with the arty fart middle class, we're all right trip. I've worked in factories and I was a porter. Toilet cleaner. Toilet cleaner. <laughs> I had a good dead end job. I was a grave digger for about a year before I started in the band. Well, I mean, if there was jobs, then they wouldn't be on the dole. Maybe we'd be singing about love and kissing. We're doing something that's not ripping them off. We're standing up for them. And we're standing up for ourselves, and they can identify with it. I think our music is very honest. It's the most honest thing that's been happening in the last 15 years. Nothing to beat it. Chaos with attitude. Make people wake up a bit. And it just appeared as though there was no future unless you do something about it. It was the only thing that told you, oh, that's the way out. Phil Donahue's who's guest this morning, have a warning. They say, watch out for punk rock. It could be hazardous to your children's health. Let's go to Chicago. I'd like to show you a picture of Jeff Hackert just two years ago. Here it is. He looks like the third baseman for a Little League team. Here is Jeff Hackert just two years later. Jeff, you are a punker, as, you, uh, as we've come to know uh, the group that is, a, you follow punk rock and you enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, why do you look so bizarre, Jeff? We work them up to the max, and then we trash the whole place. Yeah, real damn. We were, yeah. in the press, considered a menace to society. Newport Beach police are concerned that a late-blooming punk rock movement is developing in the harbor area and have predicted a rough and even violent summer because of it. People were so fearful of this new music and the way these people were dressing that you had cities trying to ban the shows and these squads of police that were going around with Polaroid cameras taking pictures of punks for files. Elvis certainly was not received very well by parents, nor were the Beatles. You're saying this is different. This is definitely different, Phil. Psychologists and doctors talking about the dangers of your kids being in the punk rock, the cessation of insanity. I believe that the music I heard is a killer. It's a killer of hope. It's a killer of spirit. You know why you people can't stomach our songs? Because they're a mirror, dig? Everybody can't stand, right people hated you so much that they would actually stop what they were doing, get out of their car. Hey, punk rock faggots, you know, we flipped them off. 
And they turned around and came back and we fought. You could literally be killed for being a punk rocker. If you walked down the street and saw somebody look like that, it was almost instantaneous that you became friends with that person. You knew right away if somebody was on your team and there wasn't many. You know, it was a secret kind of music and it was different. When I found it, it was just the portal to the countercultural world that I had been looking for. <laughs> Growing up as a kid, it was like, you don't go backstage, you don't talk to the band, there's security, it's all of this kind of shit. So all of a sudden, here I am, some kid, I walk into the backstage area for the plugs, and I like, I go, oh, sorry, you know, sorry, excuse me, man, I'm sorry. And, and Barry from the plugs goes, hey, no problem, have a beer, kid. And I'm like, yeah. Being this far from Dee Dee Ramon at Louis Rock City in Falls Church, Virginia, does make Frampton Comes Alive pretty pale in comparison. And you know you'll probably never be back to the arena very often. I was going to the Starwood in Hollywood, seeing these great bands, and then coming back to school the next day and going, none of you guys even know what's going on. You just keep practicing your cheerleader cheers, and you keep passing that football, man, but you don't even have a fucking clue. The music actually meant something to people. It gave, it gave like, a lot of people, like, I believe something to believe in. It gave people a platform to, to believe in and to express itself. What we was was second generation punk. We believed in the hype of the first generation, which was like real working class, saying what you felt was wrong with society, and we was very angry, and this was our outlet. And all of a sudden, music became very quickly this thing that was either going to be a huge part of our lives or our lives. We went down to uh, Madam's Organ for the first time yeah. and saw like the Bad Brains and I was like, bam, this is it. It was seriously like an epiphany. It was the summer of 1981. So everybody had a band, you know. My friend and I had a band, you know. We had no songs, we had no instruments. You know, we never played a show, we never rehearsed. We but yeah, we're in the band, you know. How long have you guys been together? Eight months. Yeah. Ten months. Eight or ten months. Ten months? Ten, ten hours. Yeah. Bands were being formed because bands weren't touring and coming to Washington. It's like, well, if we're not on the same New York, LA thing where every band that's specific to what we like comes there, we'll make our own bands. <laughs> It's just shouting. And I thought, well, I can do that. I'm going to go to the bathroom. You sing. OK, what are we doing? I, I've never sung in a band before. You're in a band now till he gets back from the bathroom. Bands would come out that were brand new with friends that were in the band. They'd say, hey, we're playing our first show. And we go and watch them. And just you just get blown away. Because there were no rules. It could be anything. You could just be smashing a typewriter with a sledgehammer. And that was totally cool. Like, wow. <laughs> It didn't matter if anybody had any talent or could do anything. It was whether they had the balls and the guts to get up and do it. We did it for fun and also because we wanted to challenge the boundaries and we wanted to get people to think and we wanted to politicize people. Various versions of socialism and anarchy and sort of mixes of in-between things like that were coming out through lyrics that were either informed or innocent but just basically said, we want to run our own lives. You can talk about religion, you can talk about politics, you can talk about football. The vibe was really cool because everybody pretty much knew each other. It was like a big party. You were there as early as possible and you were there till as late as possible and you were there for every band. She says the kids are very, very loyal. That they'll go back and see the same band night after night after night. Yeah, so? Well, it is possible that whoever killed the boy thinks he got away with it, he might go back to the club. Yeah, 
It was not just like some local phenomenon, it was like a national, and then we discovered slowly it was like international phenomenon that was going on. DC had it going on, Boston, New York, Minneapolis, Chicago, Seattle, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, everyone had like cool bands. As records started coming out and fanzines started developing to like talk about the records that were coming out, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And you hear about this band that you read about and so you send off for the Black Flag Nervous Breakdown EP through the mail and the bass player sends you the EP and says, hey, can we sleep on your floor when we come through town? And all of a sudden, Joey Shithead from DOA is camping out on your floor, and the subhumans are living at your buddy's place down the street, and everyone's networking. That whole kind of circuit started the DIY thing by exchanging numbers. There was a network of fake phone credit card numbers that people used to pass around. I got a new number for you. Because nobody could afford the phone bills for all the work we were doing. So entire tours were being booked off of just these fake credit card numbers. But if I want to, I will we were just putting on shows, renting out clubs, renting out halls, wherever we could do shows at. Kids live for music, so how ironic that the music they live for, they can't go see because they're not old enough to see it. We were really committed to the idea of getting these venues open to kids. So we just went to the club and said, look, we're not going to drink, we're going to put these big black X's on our hands. If we had the X's on our hands, you see us drinking, kick us out of the club forever. And in, in return for that, let us come to the gigs. And we had the feeling, you know, if we could ever get this to teen audiences, and people would really like it because it's like the rebirth of the spirit of rock and roll that corporations and major labels went so far out of the way to kill. In the early stages, you know, there were no record labels at all that wanted to work with the band, let alone major record labels. You know, it was kind of like, this is crazy shit. They didn't look at it like a viable commodity like they do today. They looked at it like an insurance risk. <laughs> We're out there yeah, yeah, yelling and screaming, and to Warner Brothers, like, come here, come here, come here. like was it sort of bug in here? No, it, it's, it's punk rock down here. Oh, well, you know. It became pretty much evident that if we wanted to put this record out, we were just going to have to put it out ourselves. It took us a few months to figure out how to do it. We didn't want anyone to think that we were trying to cash in. So we said, any money that comes back from this single, we'll put into putting out another band in D.C. Of course, the major label's not going to sign us, and we wouldn't want to be with them anyway. What do we want to have anything to do with that? So we start our own label. Initially, it was just your close friends that were playing, and within, God, it's like six months, you'd see the parties. It was 50 people here, and then it was like 100, and then it was like 200, and then it got to the point where they shut down the party before you could play. Then the Buzzcocks come to town, or the Clash, and all of a sudden, who are all these people? You call me the Cramps play the psychedelic, place the size of this room. It's a big deal, like 300 people? Ew, I don't know every name in this room. Sell out. Once the media started popularizing it, then all these people started showing up, and it was like, well, we saw this on TV, or we saw this in this movie, we saw this photo, so we figured this is the way that we have to behave. Anyway, the punks took the pogo step, went wild, invented the slam. Well, the more people you... Yeah, did the dancers get hurt? Well, that's the idea. Band-Aids and bloody noses are punk status symbols. Probably for the first half of the 80s, Black Flag was perceived as the thing, or one of the things. Like, if you bands would think, oh, if I could just get up there. And up there meant sleeping on people's floors, not having any place to live, being poor all the time, this type of thing. And that was the top. We were like a shark. If we stopped moving, we didn't eat. 
You know, that van had to keep moving from gig to gig or there's no food. I mean, I think one of the most important chapters of the history of rock and roll, history of music, was the time that all the kids got together, wrote their own songs, formed their own bands, put on their own shows, put out their own records, made their own magazines, set up their own touring networks, you know, set up this whole thing, and the major labels were completely unaware. So Mike, tell us about the tour so far. Well, here we are, and boy, what a show it is, look. <laughs> Luckily, no effects stayed together through the late 80s because all our friends' bands, you know, SNFU and RKL, they all called it quits because there weren't a lot of fans out there. I think it was just a very low ebb for punk rock. I mean, there just wasn't much happening right then. A lot of metal, you know, not a lot of punk. Only there were a few bands in America that were playing punk in the, in the late 80s. I even remember like the Anti Club, which was supposed to be like the last holdout of punk clubs or whatever, said, yeah, we're not really booking punk bands. We just played backyard parties and stuff before that with other punk bands that couldn't get a venue to, to let them play. When we first started, it was like everybody was playing fast. Everybody was playing aggressive. Everybody was macho. You know, it, that was you know everybody was taking off their shirt and showing off their muscles to to other young boys taking off their shirts and showing their muscles. And we were like, well, you know, that's not what we want to do. And we want to get into more of songwriting. Bad Religion came back in '88 with Suffer. And that was the first melodic punk album, it seemed to me, in four or five years. For us, that was a big influence. Their music and their lyrics especially were really cerebral and had a lot to do with the human condition and, and our evolution as a species. And I think that just kind of started something that just kind of slowly festered. We put out a pretty decent record, so it uh, kind of reignited the scene in a way. It was right after that that Operation Ivy put out their record. So all of a sudden that year, you know, two really killer records had come out of the West Coast. You know, Operation Ivy was such a huge band to me. They were just like, I was 15 years old when I got into that band. I just remember thinking like, this is like the greatest band in the world. But that's when the punk renaissance started. There was always a few uh, punk rock, you know, splashes in the mainstream, but not from a young new band that was really part of a movement until. Green Day, Green Day, like the Offspring, and I love the Offspring. The Offspring. And Pennywise, Rancid, 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 you know, Green Day, Rancid, Green Day, and and uh, Rancid and the Offspring. I'm surprised it took as long as it did with punk. Uh, part of the reason, I guess, was because the music was so intense, it delayed the inevitable mass embrace. And I figured it was going to happen sooner or later. I mean, the music was too good. Up until Nirvana, Bad Religion and Fugazi had been kind of running neck and neck in a quiet competition of how big can this get because when Ian in a warehouse out in DC and me and Brett in a warehouse on Santa Monica Boulevard each start pushing out like 120,000 albums independently I mean punk rock had never been that big in this this day and age. I just kind of proceeded to sign a few bands but all of them did pretty well. I signed L7. The next band I signed was No Effects. Then I signed Pennywise, The Offspring, Rancid. Almost every single band I signed did as well or better than the, the last one. You wanna make a move, then you better come in. The ability to reason that we're so fit. We're living in your diet, your stories are true. You seek a tour, collapse, know in your throat. Why go to why she was like that kind of life? The point of time bomb. 
punk rock's been a creeping virus for a long time. Uh, but it really went off like a bomb in 91. Nirvana comes out and sells five, six million records, and it just was like, wow, that's completely out of the ballpark. Followed quickly by The Offspring, Green Day, and it was just over. It was just like, wow, this is way bigger than anyone ever imagined. <laughs> That's when, if not pure punk music, punk-inspired music, became a commercial phenomenon in this country. Well, I wouldn't take credit for breaking punk to the mainstream. No, I think that would be a, a dubious honor anyway. Which kind of breaking? <laughs> and the reason Green Day broke was because they put in a lot of hard work on their own before they were signed to a major label, and they had built up an audience that was very, very relevant. They stayed at people's houses, they built relationships with their fans. At the same time they were doing that, they were writing great songs that also went on the radio. They happened to make great videos. When we made Smash, we thought the last thing that was gonna happen was a video on MTV. Once we actually had a record that did well and became sort of successful, then it's even much harder to defend the idea that you're a, you're a punk fan. If you have a song that is heard on radio and you're sort of in the mainstream, you know, may, maybe it is a contradiction in terms. When our song Alien first came on the radio, it was really strange. I mean, we'd been playing on the radio a couple times here and there on local radio, but not like, you know, three or four times a day. It was kind of bittersweet because you're you're feeling like, okay, we finally conquered, you know, the powers that be and they gave in to us and and stuff, but at the same time, you know, your friends are calling you up going, dude, what the hell are you doing on the fucking radio? It's cool that some of these bands get exposed, but at the same time, the people that like these bands have been with them for so long, and maybe at one point, radio wasn't too friendly to those bands. There's mass media vehicles that didn't exist for punk rock, in 1981, radio, MTV, magazine. You were lucky to get your stuff played on college radio, let alone anything commercial. Regardless if you're in a punk band or not, it's weird to hear yourself on the radio for the first time. I was at work when I first heard it on the radio. I'm driving home in a 77 Monte Carlo with my painter's whites on and Prison Bound comes on the radio and you know, a car pulls up next to me and I just like, you know, I wonder if this dude knows this is me on the radio, man. And, I mean, still painting the houses, but, you know, I'm on the fucking radio. It's nice to be able to get the message out to a wider, to a, a larger group of people for free. The real victory for us, I think, was when Fuck Authority got played on the radio. We all really liked that song, and we thought it would be a great song for the radio, but who's going to play a song called Fuck Authority? Sorry, uh, Avril Lavigne doesn't count as punk. Oh yeah? Well, what about the cramps? Stiff little fingers. The Clash. Sex Pistols. You're listening to the same music as Marissa Cooper? I think I have to kill myself. It's the punk, huh? I'm angry. 
like every creative movement, you know, it starts with an underground base and it, and it, it attracts people that are like-minded and if it if it's, has enough depth to it, then it, it becomes co-opted by the, the main culture. Dexter Holland of The Offspring got his PhD in molecular biology at USC. Greg Ginn of Black Flag graduated from UCLA. The guy from Bad Religion got his master's in geology from UCLA and he's working on his PhD in evolutionary biology at Cornell. Society now is totally accustomed to hearing, I mean, when you turn on TV and you hear a commercial that's got like a, a punk rock riff in it, it's pretty incredible because, you know, 10 years ago you would have never heard that. When we presented this Pathfinder spot to our client, it wasn't alien to them. So I don't think they said, well, geez, we love the commercial, but what's with that punk soundtrack? If you were an advertiser and you didn't recognize this demographic of punk rock kids now, you'd be a complete idiot. Everywhere you look, you go to the mall and, you know, every third kid's got, like, something punk going on. Travis Barker, he has boost mode. It's now something that's so, like... Oh, if you're punk, you're cool, and it was never meant to be something like that. I don't think true punk rock music has been commercialized yet, but I do think the look has been commercialized. Is it the life of blast? It's just like living in the past. And we go downtown to do our shopping, and we work in suburbia. The marketing geniuses get a hold of it, and then you see it in boutiques and shops, and, and you see it in Kmart. We'll go to shows, and we'll see people wearing, you know, the way they've strapped on their strap. We're in a t-shirt that they've laced up the back and cut, and then we come back, and we try to figure it out and put it together. When I first started getting punk, to have a hot topic, I would be like, what? A place that has, like, t-shirts, and it's already made, and I don't have to go to a show. started as really just an idea to bring an alternative lifestyle to the malls. The looks on people's faces when they come into new stores opening up in remote towns is great. And just like, oh my gosh, there's a class shirt. It's definitely not rebellious now. Green hair is the norm. Tattoos are the norm. Spike bracelets, piercings. It's like, you know, you're not, you're not scaring your mom. Your mom takes you to get it. 25 years later, you know, uh, mainstream, I call the sheep have opened their minds a little bit. Obviously, they, they're letting their 13-year-old kids dye their hair red now and wear punk rock t-shirts to school. These are the parents who are throwing apples at the punk rockers across the quad in high school. And I know it, but now it's cute because their kid's doing it and it's accepted and it's crossed over. I think it's kind of wonderful and kind of sad that it doesn't have the shock value that it used to. But it's kind of cool that, that, that if a kid wants to dye their hair blue, that they don't have to put up with all the grief. It's become more of a widespread style statement. But it's not really a heart statement. Back in the 70s and up into the early 80s, I think it was a real statement of who you were, where you were what you believed, who your friends were, who your enemies were. When I was growing up, dyeing your hair or looking different was really a commitment, and you were committing to having people react to you in a certain way. Prefabricated rips and tears and all that shit, it's bullshit, dude. I mean, let's fucking look cool for a minute, buy a clothes with some stitched up holes in that shit, and fucking parade around. I don't know, dude, to me that's just ridiculous, man. You, you might get someone that says, oh, you know, you're in a mall and you're punk rock and what have you done to our scene? But most of the bands that are in it really come to us, too, to, to help them kind of get a leg up on getting out there because we're one of the first places they can get distribution. Go for Kevin. I'm out at the front of the line getting doors open. Fuck corporate America was the motto of the day when I was working in the clubs. And then I'm like, well, you know, we spend money in corporate America. Why don't I try to go get some of this? They're going to sell to you anyhow, even though you don't think you're buying it. And I'm going to use some of the money and at least give kids a great day with some of the money. Let's go out and do a tour, get some friends together, some bands. We treat everyone equally. Let's go out and share buses. Let's go out and do something. Bring a skate ramp. Went out, put it together. But I had worked really hard. And I had respect from all these bands and people. But I think people saw that we had something.
the merch companies and the punk record labels and the record stores, you know, and all these people, they're doing it themselves. I think the Warped Tour just kind, kind of promotes the DIY idealism that punk rock's all about. No dressing rooms, no hierarchy. Maybe some bands are in vans or buses. You never know when you're gonna play. At 11 o'clock, I'm telling the venue, we're going doors because kids know the schedule is posted. They got to get in because we may have the first band at 1130. Some people might accuse me of taking the edge off of punk rock. But I believe punk rock should be able to listen to by everyone. And it's all varying degrees of punk rock. And it's great that I can put the casualties and Good Charlotte in the same setting. But this is one of the best tours for the casualties because we get in front of so many new kids, you know? So many kids that, like, are uh, new to this kind of punk rock. You get the real hardcore, like, casualty fans, you know, up in the front. And then you see, I see kids in the back just really interested. And then I'll see that kid later when we're just hanging out at our tent. And he'll like get a T-shirt, he'll get a CD and stuff, and so that's it's cool, like you know, exposing those kids to some of this kind of like yeah, you have your other stuff that most of the kids here like, but like come check this out, you know. It's just kind of kept growing. We have corporate affiliation, but we operate very independently in how we do this thing because they don't want to pretend that they know how to produce this tour. just see it as another commercial venture designed to make money for everybody involved and take it all off the people who go to the gig. I don't think that's very nice at all. Oh, I'm going to sing about big business and, you know, fuck this, fuck that, yet I'm going to make all this money for this big company, you know what I mean? It's, it's completely ironic. It's the business taking over, you know, they're sponsored by all kinds of companies. It's just business and it's all, like, just conning the kids to buy millions and millions of pounds worth of merchandise and that's all it is. The, the problem is, is that, okay, if you decide like, okay, I'm not going to have anything to do with corporations because I'm so much of a crusty gutter punk and I'm the most punk guy in the world, okay, well, I'm not going to have anything to do with corporations. Well, you're going to pretty much have to sit in your house and never go outside because unfortunately, if you live in America and most parts of the world, corporations make the clothes that you're wearing right now makes the, the antiperspirant everyone's wearing, the perfume that you're wearing, the, the food that you eat. Vans is a big corporation. Although they're more geared towards what we do and they're supporting the scene, that was cool. The first year we had a rough time in 96, well, Vans, hmm, they were all cautious. But then they started getting to know us and see that we were really the same culture. We were supporting the same things. When Target came in, it really it really upset us, and we almost thought about not doing it. But then, you know, hey, I, I shop at Target all the time. Thanks to them, that, that music is still out there, you know, that took care of us. They pay for our buses, they make sure that we, we stay alive. You throw out the argument of, like, well, what's so offensive about it? And people really can't really say exactly why it's offensive, because it, it's not, you know, people have to realize that they're not representing an entire community all the time. People do things because they're individual and that's what how they want to have their band. It's, I think it's totally okay to go in and take their money as much as possible. I think that's more punk than anything else. It's easier for us to sort of use the, 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 the tools and the channels that the capitalist industry are offering us for free than to try to do it ourselves and reach not as many people as those greedy bastards are opening the ways for us to reach. Some people say they're fighting for our freedom, they're fighting for our safety. Some people say they're fighting for oil companies and for Halliburton and for multinational corporations. I don't want to tell you what to believe. All I want to ask of you is try to look through the haze and try to look through the fucking bullshit.
there seems to be an invisible line for everybody that's ever touched upon punk rock. And that invisible line almost goes from the pistols breaking up at Winterland to mumble, 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 maybe something happened and maybe it didn't, and then hi, Nirvana. That's like 15 years in the middle of that. So what do you think punk rock did? Go away and have a rest for 15 years? No, punk rock carried on. The punk rock world was healthy and wonderful, but it all went underground. So as we hear all these punk revivals, it's never been a punk revival because punk's never been away. <laughs> And you've stopped by it all these years and it's been hard. It's been really hard. But again, if you go like 20 years, with no backing or no support or nothing back in the UK. And the, the only thing that, that kept us going is the people within gigs and all the punks they used to come and visit us because they knew that we believe, really believed in the music as much the same. still write about things that, that matter to me and, and things that I find important and I hope that if I find them important and they, they matter to me then other people will find them important and they'll matter to them and therefore they're worth doing. If you'd have said to me that I'd still be in a band 26 years on, I would have laughed in your face. If you'd said to me at the time that punk rock has any sort of future in terms of 26 years, I equally would have laughed in your face. Social Distortion is still a punk band. You know, we've held on to most of the ideals that we had when we started the band. The rebellion and the energy and the angst, the dissatisfaction for the status quo. Who ever thought that you'd, you know, make a record that would last? You're like, we, we never thought we'd be alive in 20 years. Yeah, that's exactly much, much less sit there talking about it. I never thought I would play punk rock music for more than the night that we got up and played. We're all addicted to it. And that's my downfall. You know, and sometimes I wonder we should sort of start this as Betty Ford clinic for punk rockers. We play all over the world, and I mean, punk is still a big thing. It's probably bigger now than it's ever been. It's, it's younger. getting younger. It's there's frightening. Like a, there's a new wave of people who, who come to see us now. We don't just get the people that are around when we first started. We get, like, you know, those 12 year old kids there last night with singing 999 songs, you know? Just watching these bands keep the show as good as a hundred years ago, up to that same level of energy and excitement is, and watching the crowd, it was just like, yeah, now this is, this is longevity of purpose. The thing about the punk lifestyle is that it is the real alternative lifestyle, you know, we're not part of the true society and um, we don't want to be cheated by society. You know, I was born at the end of the Second World War and there's a big thing about, oh, all these pensioners, well, you know, like, they won't get their pensions when they're 65 or whatever age, you know. Who cares about that? The government will cheat you if they can, you know, so why bother? You've got to do your own thing. UK subs, hello, we're the UK subs. Boom, 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 top of the pops, front page headlines, everything. Blue or green there, Elvin Gibbs, Nicky Garrett, pulling shapes, green vinyl singles, red vinyl albums, this, then the other. Then suddenly they've vanished. No, they haven't vanished. They've only vanished if you live in normality. If you are a fully paid up resident of planet normal, A, don't need to know about you and what you're doing. B, more importantly, the UK subs never vanished. They're still there. God bless old Charlie. He, he's doing, you know, every album for the letter for the bloody alphabet. Tonight, 
there's been this traffic of people through that band. If they ever have a reunion, they'll need to hire a fucking Dodger Stadium to put all the boys in. Charlie Harper, uh, Brian Barnes, Alan Campbell, Campbell, Jason Lowsman, Bed with my dinner, <clears throat> Nick Garrett. <sighs> Alvin Gibbs, I, Steve Roberts, Pete Davis. I was just thinking about all the different periods of the UK subs because there's like the period before I joined and then there's the period after me when it was Jim Mulcair and Captain Scarlet. You had the people who went to Wisconsin and then I come back with Alan and Brian. Paul Slack. Paul Slack. Steve Slack. Steve Slack. My brother was in the subs, you know, the very first couple of months or whatever. He didn't want to do it. I stepped in. Flea. Tez. Who the hell else First time we ever came to the States, I mean, we, we loved it straight away. Our first show was in a place called Hurrah's. It was packed out. And we come on stage and all the girls started screaming. And we thought, shit, we're going to be the Beatles or something like this. It was suddenly, oh, you're number 20-something in the charts. You've got to do Top of the Pops. UK subs and stranglehold. One, two, three. When we were selling a lot of records and um, we were going on tour, we thought we could do no wrong. Everything we put out would sell a lot. The record company wanted the more commercial stuff and we wanted to put out the good stuff like Warhead and Countdown. We had it our way because we had complete artistic control, but we dived down and we kind of disappeared from the media. But. It's done us good, really, because, you know, we've been on the road ever since. 20 years, we're still on the road. If we would have gone up there and been like the media darlings and then the media want to kick us out a year later and get someone else in, and now we're on the road forever. That's a small one, isn't it? Oh, no. Really better. Lars Fred Erickson. Wow, well, serious. Jason Willer. Eisen. Rap, Phoebe. Oh, Devil John. John, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Somebody at Armstrong's real fucking. Is it straight Armstrong? <laughs> There's a point when you get past a certain threshold of popularity and name recognition then it gives you a certain longevity. And each plateau you go up after that gives you more longevity. When you get to the level of the clash and the pistols, there, you've got historic le long longevity there. For us, we, we didn't quite reach that plateau. We were two rungs down from that. Nevertheless, it was enough to make us internationally well known. And here we are almost 30 years later and we can still play almost anywhere in the world. And there is still an audience. Poor sod. to find out we've been banned. Driving back to London in the minivan. I, the telegram boy, how I arrive. Tell the dinosaurs they just won't survive. I remember we were stopped on the motorway once. Um, 
by the police, you know, with flashing lights and all that stuff. He said, uh, we were at a report that somebody in your bus was on fire. Because we just used to, uh, if you roll up a newspaper, you know, light a petrol out. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, the driver would be like, sort of, you know, his hair would be on fire, and that, the, the vehicle would be like, oh, screeching across the road. We ate at McDonald's only because that Olympic thing was going on when, in 84. And they had this, this special where if an American won a gold medal, you got a burger, and if an American won a silver medal, you got fries. And the Russians didn't go to the Olympics that year, so we were cleaning up, which meant we ate food. Our overhead was very low in a van, you know, in a flea bag motel. We called up the front desk and said, uh, are you still serving room service? <laughs> and the guy says, yeah, you fucking smart ass motherfucker, come get it. <laughs> She used to say to me behind the garden wall, how you got a light boy? We didn't think we'd be together. We didn't think 27 years later we'd still be playing the same band. It was just a bit of fun for us getting up on stage. The Addicts did a big festival at Murrayside Youth Club, which is where they used to practice and play quite a bit, and I went along to that with a few of my friends. I can remember thinking, oh, he's rather nice. And I can remember staring at him and him looking at me, little 15 year old man, and he said, what the fuck are you looking at, you ugly bitch? <laughs> And we've been here together. How many years have we been? 25 years. Back here now. At the time when they came out, all the other punk bands had the spiky hair and the Mohegans, and they was totally different. And they were they were individuals. They got a lot of shit back in the day because they were like a lot poppier than a lot of the other bands around. Yeah, right. But they put on an amazing live show. I must say, they get everybody going. I can't speak for. Uh a 14-year-old kid, I don't know what they feel about punk. I don't think it would be the same as we felt, because for us it was new, it was revolutionary. Now it's just fun, it's just about the music, really. my nephew too. Every time I take him driving somewhere he always requests to hear the clown band. The clown band. They're the first band like I really listened to and then like that got me into the scene and everything. The addicts are a big influence to me. The way they dress, the music, everything. It's an honor that we have spread out for so long and these kids weren't even a sperm when we were playing, you know. How about when we go on tour? I mean is that hard? Yeah. Why? Because I have all these children to look after. I don't allow him to come in his um, um, jeans with holes in or um, he's got a green hair to come pick me to school, do I? Ever since I was about four, I wouldn't let him. He's so important to most people, but he's not that important. <laughs> Having a baby doesn't make that much difference. You just get uh, even less sleep than usual. But uh, as of next week, we'll be like on the road for uh, a week or so. So it remains to be seen how our emotions will be affected. <laughs> <laughs> Touring 
is monotonous. The travelling is monotonous. Getting the gigs, sound checks, monotonous. But getting pissed, brilliant. Playing, brilliant. Meeting the fans, brilliant. Part of the success of the Addicts is obviously the fans. We have no big money, and we have no big promotion, and we have no big anything. And the bands still come out in drones because we're underground. And being underground and successful is the most difficult thing to acquire. And if you go big money after that, you may, you know, you may strike it rich or something, but you're gonna, you're gonna lose that underground following, which is the most sincere following. We didn't live no glamorous life, let me tell you. We'd stay in like dives, motel sixes, some hooker hotel in Detroit with the mirrors on the ceiling. In, in England, we, we slept under the van. That was it. When it was snowing as well, remember? Sleeping under the fucking van. With the equipment in the van so you wouldn't get it wet. Sleeping under the van, in the snow. I went to, the, went to a gig on the wrong month once. Wrong year. Oh, yeah, wrong yeah, year wrong as year. well, yeah. <laughs> Are we going to be like 65, 70 years old and still be jamming? That would be a fucking trip. A lot of people know they start bands, they expect a record deal, they expect this, that, the other. That's not why we started a band. We started a band just for something to do, not as a profession. It's just happened to end up, we've been doing it 25 years, but it's, it's still the same feeling. We do it because we love it. It's not a bad lifestyle, to be quite honest. The hotel room's not that good, but there you go. You know, there's no cockroaches on the floor. <laughs> Anybody outside who's sort of dropped out of the punk scene and looks at it now from an outside perspective sees all these, like, 40-year-old punk rockers desperately trying to keep their hair enough together to maintain the Mohican. As my brother reminded me the other day, when we were, like, 17, we would just completely take the piss out of all these old rockabillies going into the local disco to have their rockabilly nights. History repeats itself. But... If we put this proposition to the rockabillies at the time, they would have said, listen to the music, and like when you get in the summit and you're 40 and you still like it, you'll be doing exactly the same thing. And if they said that, they would have been right. Shared house. It's one of the last shared houses in Bath. For 15 years, it's had people like us living in it. That's why it's a mess. Hmm. I mean, the landlord sees things like this, and he says, this is all brand new 15 years ago. And it's just like, but it was 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> this is the desk. This travels wherever I live. It's my only, got to keep it, piece of furniture, really. If you're ever short of a hobby, start painting. Yeah. Has punk rock changed the world? Debate. Take 25 years to come up with a fucking answer. It hasn't changed the world. Yes, it has. Um, I don't know. It's changed my world and a lot of other people's. Like the world in general is a complete mess, just as bad as it ever has been, full of wars, greedy politicians. Uh, there's worse air pollution damage. There's more chemicals in your food, in the water, in the air. The whole place is coming to a grinding halt, and on an evolutionary scale, I say we've got about another thousand years left at tops um, before we die out and let the viruses take over. And good luck to them. Well, I 
as we start. But in terms of um, personal experience for a lot of people, I think punk rock has changed a lot of people's lives much for the better because they've met a whole bunch of really quite extraordinary people who have uh, given vent to their ideas and characters because they've been given an area that not only contains good energetic music but also contains the sort of root values of like being able to do exactly what you want. They want the whole market, they want the global market in terms of money, in terms of labour, in terms of cheap products, in order to gain loads and loads of power. End of lecture is a gig, all right, it's called this year's war. I've always loved the subhumans because they've always been super political, but you can argue with them and drink some pints together and shoot a game of pool and have some laughs. Some bands really take themselves too seriously. Because politics is serious, but so is life. And you can't live your life being angry all the time. Paper cut. 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 Revealing. Blimey, you can see right through it. People come here to waste it, they have a great time, you know. And a lot of people come cynical. I did, you know. The first year I was asked to play, I thought, I've got a load of old punks, <laughs> this can be rubbish. You know, as soon as I walked in, I'd loads of people I knew from touring around Europe and everyone was having a great time. I thought, well, these people understand, you know, they've still got a spirit and uh, it's not corny. There's a lot of young people here as well, so I don't think it's just celebrating the past. What's wrong with celebrating the past is the past is full of all this good stuff and if you can recreate it now to a bunch of 16 to 20 year olds who've never had the experience of it and whose only experience of punk rock is this sort of dressed up, poppy, fancy, non-political version mostly coming out of America, then I think, yeah, give it to them raw while you're still alive. <laughs> my first time here now and you see all the same faces and I think for everybody this is a drive to keep on going. I think because we don't have to rely on sponsors and things like that we can kind of do the festival that we would want to go to and so when we're booking the bands and everything we just kind of sit down with wish lists and who we'd want to see and you know who our idols are and everything. It's a communal thing, I suppose. Oh, it is a community, definitely. If not family. You see people year after year and talk about what you've been doing. and It's as much family as a lot of us have had, I think, you know, in real life. When I think back about, like, the early punk shows, I don't really think about the band hardly at all. I always think about sitting on the curb out front talking. It was just the social exchange. The bands, of course, were incredible, and they were a point of gathering. 
and they are inspiring and like the creativity and the expression, the passion, all that stuff, those are like the things that powered us up. But ultimately, I think the idea was it was, it was creating radical change with, within each of us, like spiritual change or whatever that would ultimately would play out down the road and however people chose to live their lives. Am I a punk rocker? Absolutely, man. Oh, I, got my, I tattooed it on my knuckles, Lars tattooed on my knuckles. I don't give a fuck. I'm a punk rocker until I'm 100 years old if I did that long. Mm -hmm. Now, are you a punk rocker? I don't know. You gotta, I don't give a fuck. Right. Who am I to say you're not? You know what I mean? Right. Who's a punk? I don't know. I'm not a cop. But I do know I'm a punk rocker. And I do know there's some 16-year-old kid like me who's in high school who's very shy, outsider, can't fit in. And I'm sure he, you know, he relates to certain bands <clears throat> from the outsider perspective. Mm -hmm. Is he a punk rocker? I'm sure he is. Has he got a guitar? I hope so, or an amp? I hope so. Is he gonna play punk? I bet it is gonna be punk. Some sort of mm -hmm. derivative, a derive from punk rock. So, fuck it, man. How, who am I to say that kid who's 16 isn't playing punk and isn't punk? Mm -hmm. I ain't fucking gonna call that one in. Hell no. I, I think the umbrella term punk can encompass so many different things, and people forget about that. They think of this narrow version of punk as, oh, it's a kid with the safety pin in his ear and the mohawk. There are actually a lot of similarities just as far as the way punk is labeled now as it was originally. Like bands like the Buzzcocks and the Damned and the Clash are totally different as far as their approach to the music and the, the end product of it. And now it's the same way that you can look at all these bands, like Sum 41 is so influenced by metal. And Good Charlotte's a little bit more on the poppier side. Whoa, whoa, whoa. One thing that I think bands have got to realize is they're going to go out there, they're going to put their records out, they're going to get up on a stage, and people are going to look at them and say, that's genre X. Because one of the things that the media has to do in writing about bands is to say, this sounds like this, or this fits into this style. I say pop punk. I never just say punk, because they're not. Um, they're pop, and they have some punk trimmings. <laughs> Like when I think of pop punk, I think of when it's spring and you want to open your windows and like drive in the car with the windows down. <laughs> this is the next tour update. We're here with uh, MTV Spring Break. I think we got into punk music through like um, skateboard videos and snowboard videos. Yeah, Colin got into through rollerblading. <laughs> <laughs> For us, it was just like something completely different that we'd ever heard before and that anyone else in our school was listening to. So it was just kind of like something that we could kind of call our own. Yeah, we thought we were pretty cool because we were like the only people that listened to it. Everybody was into techno or notorious B.I.G. and Julio and stuff like that. <laughs> It's like one of those things, it takes four years or five years to become an overnight success. 
I mean, obviously no one's ever heard of you until you have success, but no one knows what you've been doing previous well, to that. I mean, we just did it as we were teenagers. We just did it because we loved it and we played all the time. And lucky enough, we were to have success all of a sudden. We had a lot of opportunities. Uh, we had a lot of great friends that would, would help us out and, and take us on shows and just because they saw something special in us. And, and uh, did we, were we like beat up for the first couple of years of touring? No, but we had our hard times, and, and we did eat shit, and in my other bands, I got beat up. It's weird to say punk rock saved my life, but in a lot of respects, it did. One day, I was like a little kid, and I was like, I'm a punk rocker. I remember I said it to like one of my friend's older brothers. I didn't know what punk was. I didn't know where CBGBs were. I didn't know nothing. I hadn't read books. Like I started reading like magazines and whatever I could find and trying to like imitate these people, and I think that's how it starts out, and it just grows in you. <laughs> I have so much respect for, for the Ramones and the Clash and the Sex Pistols, you know, and the hardcore bands, Minor Threat and Black Flag. But when I got into punk, I didn't know who those bands were. Like, that was like a myth to me. The older kids, like, I'd see them in those t-shirts and I was like, oh, I wonder who that is. But when, like, that second wave came, the Rancid and the No Effects and all those bands, like, that was the old school to me. First punk band I got into was Green Day. I'm only 20 years old, so I was never into anything, like, real old school until, like, I learned about what where the music came from and then got into like minor threat. My sister would be like making me draw her pictures of like social D logos and like dead Kennedys and shit and she'd play me some music and I was like cool, you know. When I first got into Green Day when I was way younger, I mean Billy Joe is an amazing frontman and just an amazing songwriter for sure. I like Kerplunk. Oh man. The Ramones were kinda like the first band I ever heard that like kind of changed my life. Bands like the Bouncing Souls or, or Minor Threat, those were bands for kids by kids that just did it themselves. And that's how I got into punk rock because it seemed accessible. It seemed like I could actually be a part of it. seen in the last few years, I believe, is they found out there's multi-platinum success in pop versions of punk, of the punk rock idea. We've got the Sex Pistols singing about what it was like growing up in England or something. We got Blink-182 is rebelling against coaches and, and teachers and pimples. Social problems, that's what punk was about. It's just ridiculous, man. When you see this, the political climate and the state of the world's in, and people are like singing bubblegum pop songs and that, man, it's ridiculous. These punk rock groups, they look like punk rock, they sound like punk rock, they've got tattoos, they've got piercings, and they've got like spiky hair. They come off stage and they shake hands with their accountant, they meet in their corporate bloody sponsorship and this and that, and they're all bloody Sobridge judges as well, and that's the tragedy of the situation. No, it's not fucking punk rock. It's not punk rock because they have dyed hair or tattoos. It's as if somebody put out a piece of paper, this is what you're gonna look like, you're gonna jump up and down at the same time, you're gonna wear your baseball hat sideways, you're gonna get a fear string right here or here. Sometimes it's more of a fashion thing than it is the actual music. They're passing it off as some badass, you know, you know, hard <laughs> movement, you know. You know, we're, we're gonna have synchronized jumping and sing about lost girlfriends and pass it off as some like hardcore angry man movement, you know. Both bands, Sum 41 and Good Charlotte, both have punk rock roots. So, I mean, there's this big dialogue going on 
between people saying, oh, they're not punk rock or they are punk rock, you know, because they have punk rock roots or they don't play the music, you know, and I think a lot of, there's a lot of name calling. Flavor of the fucking week. You fucking listen to Sum 41. He listens to Sum 41. I know, they suck. You would know the real meaning of punk, and punk is not Sum 41. You know you're talking to Sum 41. You're in Sum 41. What? I'm saying when you got a 16 year old kid that got his entire outfit from Hot Topic is telling you that you're not punk, there's something wrong there. <laughs> We've actually become quite snobby overnight. We've gone a bit like, you know, ooh, ooh. I've actually noticed, I've noticed that your Ramones t shirt says Mark on and not Tommy. Mine says Tommy. There definitely does seem to be a thing now is there you, there's a there's a rule book with that comes along with it. And yeah. If you don't do this and you don't do that, you're not punk. And that's why we don't like to say that we're a punk band because we don't want to have to follow those rules. <laughs> there are a lot of bands that do consider themselves punk um, might not consider a lot of bands, younger bands, they're in this pop punk genre necessarily punk, so people sort of shy away from it just to avoid their heroes making fun of them. Most real punk thing, Good Charlotte or something like that is not real punk, but it really is because if you look at the Buzzcocks and all that, I mean, Jesus Christ, dude. They were, they were singing about just love and love and love and love, you know, I mean, they were like the Beatles. Because we had a few hits with a few love songs, we was known, we get like known as this, like, kind of love song band, but uh, love is like it's still an important thing in the whole scheme of things, isn't it? as political as the class and the pistols in our own way, you know, in an existentialist way. Not going, oh, the government's wrong. For us, that was too simple. We realised life was full of complexities. Beat on the brat, beat on the brat, beat on the brat with the baseball bat, oh yeah. You know, when I walked in the Ramones and saw them for the first time, I thought they were the most pop band going. We were a fast pop punk, very in your face band. I thought those were the most commercial music. You know, it was just great. And I thought Punk Magazine was like Mad Magazine. The great irony of all this is that everybody thought we were being hip and underground. We didn't think we were being hip and underground. We thought we were selling out. We thought we were doing very commercial stuff. <laughs> I think a lot of people define setting out as being popular. It's not really the band's fault. If they sell a million records, it's not because they've sold out, it's because a million people want to buy the records. It doesn't matter whether you, you practice in a basement around the corner or you're signed to the biggest record label, whatever band you are, you're just going to try and play the best music that you can. And if you're lucky enough that people like that music and will pay money for your albums, then fine. But is that setting out? I don't believe it is. There's a big feeling with bands today that want to take the ideals that they feel that they're kind of outside of the mainstream and feel that they appeal to misfits. And they don't see that that's not, you know, that they, they don't think that mainstream success is out of their realm of comprehension. I want my band to be the realist. I want it to be us, you know, unchanged, just who we are. But I want to get our music to as many, I want to get our music to everyone. We realize how lucky we are. I mean, we know how hard we work. And how hard we fought to be ourselves and be original and all that stuff and still try to make it while being yourself is tough. It's really tough. Being just a kid from New Jersey, uh, writing songs in, in my basement and, and getting into a band and playing all over the world, I feel that the world is not the same place as it was before I was here. You know, I think that's the worst thing you could possibly do is to live your life and have the world be the exact same place as it was before you. Uh, you have to make a footprint, you have to make a dent, you have to make a change. And even if that change is to say something that really means something, like, you know what, you're not alone in, in what you're feeling, and, and there's an outlet, I think 
that's that's punk rock. We've had a lot of support from radio, which necessarily isn't punk, and we've had a lot of support from MTV, which isn't punk. But I mean, the feeling and and the vibe with the four of us that that are in the band and and our songs that we wrote and those those feelings that are close to our heart. That's still punk as fuck. You don't have to go on MTV to reach a bigger audience. You, just, you have to get out there and play and just go out and walk the streets and meet new people and fucking do your thing. You know, there's never, there's never a reason to go on MTV. stage in punk rock I mean and there shouldn't be because you're playing your instruments for me but I'm also giving you an energy that you need the backyards are a lot more fun sometimes because they're a cake beer and it's cheap prices to get in and we're not all about like you know charging a bunch of money or whatever I think it's more fun I mean you don't have you're not frisked as you're going into the building not told what to wear you know you're not forced to buy five dollar bottles of water I have friends that live here and stuff and it's just a big house everybody you know comes together and they put on good shows we throw these awesome parties just to raise money for utilities because other than that i don't think any of us could afford to live here it's hard you know trying to maintain this place it's fucking you know it's a labor of love this place is a really big place in this neighborhood as far as these kids go they're like this, this is the place that makes or break you in this neighborhood Me and Ursula sat down and like totally listed off everything we wanted in a house and weirdly this house had it. This was the last place we looked at and we were like, oh, it's our dream house, it has everything. We had written down all of us a bunch of names and we named our house The Drunk Tank. a community basically right away like I felt at home like everyone that lived here was really nice and stuff and I had a good time but every Sunday there's dodgeball and it's like a ritual for a lot of kids that like hang out around here my week basically like isn't the same if I don't come like this I have school and like my parents and stuff and I'm just like Arr! and then like I just get to come here and like, just mm, in your face That's That's you. It's more of a family than I've ever had. You know, they just, they take care of everybody, each other, you know, and they look out for each other. There's no, like, drama here, you know, like with my parents. They're really selfish, like they live in a two-story house. My mom drives the Corvette and everything, but there were a lot of times where I was like, I don't even know if I'm going to have a meal today. I've always lived in places like this. Back in the day, there were certain houses that were like this too, you know. Kids get together and they pull together what they can out of their meek jobs or unemployment benefits or... There's just something in certain people's guts that tell them that this is what they have to be. It's not a way of dressing, it's not a way, it's not even a type of music, it's the, it's the attitude that you have behind it. It's an outlet for getting any uh, alienation I ever received from anybody in any social situation for my entire life. And it's my way to voice my opinion and whether people agree with it or not, uh, I'm having my say. If I have to play basement shows the rest of my life or whatever, I don't really care. I, I have more fun and am happier as a human being when I'm playing, play, playing music. It's so refreshing to meet bands who have never watched MTV, who don't care, who know they're gonna sell 400 records and do not care. They make me feel like I'm a commercial artist. Just when I think that punk rock has been commercialized and abused to its full extent, I find that some 13, 14 year old is going to a show somewhere that they're putting on themselves and that their friends' bands are playing at. There still is an underground, 
and it's a beautiful thing. A lot of bands scrape up their money and all their pennies to fill the gas tank and get in the van and just go out and play wherever they can. That's a beautiful thing. Punk that's, that's band that's point. on the underground scene that's coming up bigger and maybe we will make it to that bigger scene someday and but we're gonna do it on our terms we're not we play our music the way we want to play it I think we could go pretty far with our band I mean I think it could eventually become a career if we get like a label and we keep making more records and stuff <laughs> trying to do is um, find a label that won't like own our music like yeah. we want to still have ownership of our own songs. It would be ideal. Once you get signed and touring people think you're just like rich and you like party all the time and it's insane. The guarantee that we're gonna get will cover maybe a third or if we're lucky half of the just the gas cost. We can tour and make just enough to pretty much pay our bills and eat and uh it's cool we're out there you know selling records and, and uh getting our music out there i always thought we would play in basements you know and and we did i mean for the first three or four years we would do u.s tours but they'd be all basements and i love that community and i love that scene and when you're touring around and you go all over the country and you realize that there are all these people out there that feel the same way about things that you do and you realize wow we're not just this little microcosm we're not all alone things that we sing about could be construed as cliche as far as punk rock is concerned but it's not us that is cliche it's the fucking world nothing ever changes <laughs> more relevant now than it was then because of the way the world is and the politics and you get fucking W Bush. I know the human being and fish can coexist peacefully. No question that the enemy has tried to uh, spread sectarian violence. Uh, they use violence as a tool to do that. I never learned about politics from, from school. I learned po about politics from punk rock. If there's something that's brought to taught to me that is has like a sense of humor or a twist or it's twisted or or, or whatever, it's it's much much more interesting than it than like some boring textbook in a school. It's a medium where people are trying to fight isolation and feeling of just being alone and stuck in a society where they don't fit in. There's still pollution. There's still people starving. There's still injustice and inequality. Those things haven't gone away. And I thought that punk was kind of hippies with teeth. A lot of the kind of hippie kind of philosophy was incorporated into the punk thing, like freedom and don't take no for an answer and just like change the, the shitty society that we live in. We are patriotic citizens too! Because we're the ones who care enough about our country to say this to the government when they run it the wrong way. Punk rock got us into politics, made us inspired to be part of a 
anti-globalization movement made, made us inspired to go to demonstrations, made us inspired to read books and get educated. I do think it is an alternative community and it is a community that provides people with, with an alternative to the mainstream. Of course you're going to say fuck the government, that's what punk does, you know? Of course you're going to say fuck everyone else, but I've always been looking for somebody to tell me why. Yeah. Why should I fuck the government? I think that there are very few bands that are really taking those steps to go ahead and say something and that's always something I try to do. I wouldn't be punk and it wouldn't be punk rock if you weren't. Never again. If you think about it, um, the ideas that were hatched in these really tiny, weird cells underground, they, are, they have manifested to be hugely influential on in the world. There still are DIY scenes across the whole planet in any country you can think of. There is a punk scene going on. I don't know how different New Zealand is to the rest of the world because I've never been overseas. All, I could, all I've seen is what I've seen on record covers. During the 90s when the uh, war broke, you know, the big problem was the lack of enthusiasm because a lot of bands uh, were playing just their hometowns because they were still restricted, they couldn't get uh, gigs outside Serbia. <laughs> with this country here, Iceland, which is, uh, this is not an accurate photo, it's really just like this. <laughs> <laughs> Not many, but they're like long lasting. This is a place, it's like actually the, the, the only fun place for concerts and fun activities in Nunes. In my country is getting better and better, so it was a little bit down a couple of years ago, but there are loads of new kids starting a punk band again, and it's more and more bands coming to my country again. And top of that is calling Pro Punk Rock Objects. We have begun to listen to punk at 12 years, and the first group which we have begun to listen to was Green Day. Israel is a very small country, so there are very little people here that listen to music such as punk. They are used to listen to Israeli music, so it's hard to be a punk rock band. The ideas that came to us through punk rock can actually reach out to a lot of people, then it's a good thing that it's happening. The late punk rocker Joey Ramone's name now graces an East Village street corner. I had a great time. We were up there with Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis Presley, The Beatles, The Stone, Chuck Berry, you know, all the greats. And the winner is Green Day, American Idiot. I never thought when I was a kid that you would ever see the hour when punk rock was going to be getting Grammy nominations. I still love getting in a van and I would get in a van with these guys right now and go and do some shows across America. This is officially our first show at CBGB's ever. That's what I love. I still identify as a punk. I still feel like I'm a 
square peg in a round hole. And that's good. If the Sex Pistols had slavishly copied what was going on at the time, nobody would have ever heard of it. We were looking for heart and soul and for, um, for attitude more than anything else. We joined a, a boarding school, an army of thought, and said it wasn't a school of thought anymore. It was like now we were in the barracks. It turned us on in the most amazingly rich way, where we were like, you felt like you were king of the world because they didn't get it, and we did. And they weren't part of it, and we were. And for it to still be doing that for kids today, it's got to have some, some work. The fact that punk rock is still going and will still carry on is just testament to the fact that what punk rock does for to anybody into it is just it buzzes them up with a vibrancy and an energy and an anger or a love. It just wham. It's short, it's fast, it's in your face, and it doesn't mess about. And it's that vibrancy that creates the reincarnation of punk rock over and over and over again. As long as there's rebellious kids out there that are going to do what they want and not give a fuck and make us think about things they believe in, then that's what it all came from in the first place. They brought it down to us, we're going to bring it down to our kids. It's a great satisfaction in it because it's like we fucking prevailed, man. Just like we told them when we were fighting them on Sunset Boulevard. And it's like, who gets the last laugh? He's laughing now, motherfucker.